I continue on my journey through the southwest of Turkey. Join me as I discover more of Turkey's rich, interconnected culture, discovering ancient cures, and visiting sacred sites in this place often referred to as the Other Holy Land. Turkey continues to surprise me with new discoveries. For instance, did you know that St. Nicholas, known all over the world as Santa Claus, was actually born in Turkey? The town of Demre, which in the past was the Lycian city of Myra, is where we can trace the life of St. Nicholas. Excavations have unearthed the church where St. Nicholas served as a bishop. Here we are. I'm way below this uh, present-day surface, as you can see. And this is the church of Santa Claus or Saint Nicholas. This man was a man of the 4th century, born in Patara, about one hour away, further west. Then he became one of those early Christians to serve the Lord. He served the Lord over here as the bishop, and he died over here. The church is an important example of Byzantine architecture and is now a World Heritage Site. Mehmet tells me that the bishop had a reputation for secret gift-giving, and many stories float around of his miracles. Three daughters of a family, very poor, almost to go into prostitution for their dowry. And having heard about this, now it was him who came to the home and drop down golden sacks or bags through the chimney. And the next morning, the three girls were so happy seeing the golden coins over there. So where did the Christmas reindeer Santa Claus uh, concept come from? That's Finnish. <laughs> That's Finnish. We see it on TV, reindeers, you know, uh, being drawn you know, on the snow, etc. It's amazing how the universal icon of Christmas that kids all over the world look forward to came from the humble, generous bishop from a small corner of the Mediterranean coast. From Demre, we headed up north, passing some agricultural towns. Some ladies just harvested fresh green chili peppers and were preparing them for bottling. In this region of Turkey, where people in the past depended on the yield of the land, they made sure to seek the favor of the deities, particularly the goddess of good harvest and fertility. This brings us to Aphrodisias, the city of Aphrodite, known as the Greek goddess of love, beauty, and prosperity. The earliest settlements in this land appear to be 7,800 years ago, making it one of the oldest inhabited places on Earth. As early as this, the worship of a mother goddess for good harvest was practiced here. When the Greeks came, they adapted the local practice into their own mythology, turning the mother goddess into Aphrodite. And this was the main road before. That's the main road going to the Agora and then connecting to the theater. theater. So this is all redone, but basically this was all piled up here. Tumbled down, covered up by landslides and earth, tilted up and you dig out one or two meters and everything comes back to life. The museum holds an incredibly huge and finely crafted collection of sculptures, reliefs and artifacts recovered from this area. 2,000 years ago, in the city school of sculpture, young artisans learned to masterfully sculpt 
the delicate marble from nearby Mount Baba into works of art still admired today. We walk along walls of expressive human faces, which used to decorate theaters, down to a beautiful gateway or tetrapylon. which leads to the focal point of the town, the Temple of Aphrodite. This is the magnificent structure. Look at all this sculptural work, this beautiful temple. Most of these columns are put back up, except those two. They are still original, intact from the time of construction. Through the years, the temple was converted into a Byzantine church, with its pillars move around to create the church structure. Not far from the temple is a vast stadium, one of the biggest and best preserved in the region. Such was the city's devotion to their goddess. The gladiators used to battle before 30,000 spectators, all in her honor. The place still resonates with a sense of the divine, a power so eternal which one can only expect from a city dedicated to timeless concepts like love and beauty. Up next, I get a glimpse of the local life and pay a visit to Turkey's Eternal Springs. continue on my journey through southwest Turkey, we reach the Lycus River Valley where there once stood sister cities, Laodicea and Herapolis, both flourishing at the same time, rivaling each other in business and politics. At that time, Laodicea was a center of banking and finance, a crossroads of trade and was even known for its school of medicine. Laodicea became a very wealthy city. Based on commercial activity of black wool from the black sheep and also special ointment they used to make from certain plants, selling them, a lot of merchants, you know, a lot of materialistic power. Its ruins, though not yet fully restored, show the signs of its early grandeur. You wouldn't even imagine there was such a gigantic temple. It also has excavations of what may be the earliest Byzantine church in the region. One of the early churches of Christianity dating back to 4th century AD. Laodicea is also one of the seven churches of Asia Minor mentioned in the book of Revelation of the New Testament. This is the place of St. John where he sent the seventh and final letter. You're neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. The message reproaching the people's materialism and lukewarm faith really hit home for the people of that time because they indeed had a problem with their water supply. Being located in the valley, Laodiceans had a difficult time getting water into their city. There's a very beautiful relevant water distribution system having the hot water from Pamukkale or Hierapolis and cold water from the mountains there, mm -hmm. making it lukewarm. So they had to be content with water that is neither refreshing nor healing. On the other side of the valley was the city of Herapolis, now a World Heritage Site. Built on a plateau above the Lycus River Valley, even in ancient times, it has been widely known as a place of cure. The city was surrounded by mineral-rich hot springs known for their healing properties. Today, it's the Turkish province of Denizli, and crowds of people, even locals, still come to the area for the healing hot springs. So, Raymond, how did people discover this 
medicinal part of the springs here. You have some uh, medicinal doctors, for instance, coming into the picture. They begin to discover the anatomy of the body. So this way, they see the curing effect of the water bubbling up naturally. When they go inside, they feel much better. This is good for rheumatism, respiratory problems, bronchitis, good for intestines, tummy. In fact, if you drink it to source, you know, they say it increases sexual vigor. Okay. I don't know about <laughs> that, but, but it is written like that. Before heading to the historic part of the city, we walked around the town center, taking a look at the local products. Dried herbs and spices with healing properties are popular finds. This region of Turkey enjoys a temperate climate, making it favorable for some traditional ice cream. Or a fresh cup of tea. Or maybe both in one afternoon. From the town, we headed for the cliffs where the ruins of the ancient city are found. Outside the city walls are a vast necropolis, an ancient cemetery with tombs and sarcophagi dating from different points in history. Most of them have epitaphs. Their names, their jobs, their profession, and sometimes very strong statements. Don't disturb my peace. I send you all my damnations and curses if you disturb my peace. Let's take a look inside. This is the one with curses on it. Be careful, let's behave ourselves. <laughs> it is quite an archaeological find, giving us a clearer picture of life and of death at that time. Another important archaeological discovery in this area is the martyrium of St. Philip, one of the Twelve Apostles. For many years, the Martyrium, an octagonal building constructed in the honor of the Apostle, looked over the city of Hierapolis as a pilgrimage site for early Christians. But just recently, archaeologists have dug up the actual tomb of the martyred Apostle, just 40 yards away from the building. From this vantage point, one can just imagine the subterranean network of springs extending for some 50 miles under the mountains, emerging into the city's pools. These antique Roman pools have water surfacing at 35 degrees Celsius and with a heavy content of minerals. The pools are littered with underwater fragments of ancient marble columns, likely from the Temple of Apollo toppled by earthquakes into the water today. But perhaps the most prominent site in all of Herapolis is these beautiful formations in Pamukale. Pamukale means cotton castle. These terraces are made of calcium deposits left by flowing waters. The warm calcium-rich waters cascade over the cliffs, and as they cool down, they leave dramatic formations and pools. It is a beautiful sight, like seeing waterfalls frozen over time. Catching the colors of the setting sun. Up next, I conclude my journey through Turkey's turquoise coast, flying over its grandest ancient city. From the Lycus River Valley, we head back closer to the coast to the port city of Izmir. Like most Turkish cities, it has had a long and rich history. 
retaining landmarks from different points in time. The area is also known for its leather production. And here at Baguio Rossini in Izmir, we find some of the best quality and latest trends in leather fashion. We are an Italian uh, Turkish uh, leather fashion company. Most of the people they don't know, uh, Turkey is after New Zealand, the country in the world with more lambs per inhabitant. I know that because I eat lamb chops every day. Yes, so <laughs> they eat the meat, we use the skin. Of course. So it's a win-win system. So it's a lamb skin, most of it. Exactly, exactly. Exclusively lamb skin. Uh, why? It's not just because they eat a lot of uh, lamb, it's actually because it's the most finest and at the same time softest uh, and resistant leather you can find. You have to feel it. Wow, I might look too handsome. Pillows, or if we put more clothes, you can play with the zipper. This is a jacket, of course, which looks quite nice. Okay, my problem is I can't breathe. I have to leave it open. Yeah, we have to open it. Otherwise, anyway, I'm getting too fast. No, you are not. Too many, too many lamb chops here. Yes. <laughs> Izmir is also where the most important city of the entire Roman province of Asia Minor used to be. The grand city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a neocorus in Roman times, which means privileged city. You can in fact call it like being sort of second capital, eastern capital of the Roman Empire. We walked along the city's marble pathways, marveling at the structures before us. You got this beautiful street of Curatus, where there was everlasting fire between these government states, and then a lot of monuments along the street, including the shops. And also we got some of these terrace houses where the royalty used to live. Chariot wheels still mark the marble paths. Carved reliefs, decorated walls, and pillars. It wasn't difficult to imagine what a thriving and beautiful city Ephesus used to be. Walking further up led to an impressive building facade. This was originally the tomb of Governor Celsius of Ephesus. After he passed away, his grandson became the governor and built this magnificent library in memory of him. The library held 12,000 scrolls and was the third largest in the ancient world. Not far from the library is the stadium carved on the base of Mount Payan. It is an equally dramatic sight, big enough for 25,000 spectators. The library and the stadium are only some of the public buildings the citizens of Ephesus enjoyed. A curious sign carved on the marble streets near the port leads to another building. It's a heart with a pole where you put your coin, left foot going there, and a picture of the lady. This is the sign going to the House of Pleasure. I think I better head that way. The so-called House of Pleasure was actually connected underground to the Library of Celsus. What a convenient excuse to study or borrow a scroll at the library. A beautiful marble street led to what used to be the harbor. Ephesus used to be a thriving port city. Trading ships from distant lands would come here. People of different cultures met on these very streets. But the Earth's movement and siltation of soil deposits over time made the water recede. Eventually, ships could no longer enter the city and started moving to the nearby port of Izmir. This led to the abandonment of the once magnificent city of Ephesus. Near the ancient city stands a lone pillar. It is hard to believe that this used to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
this is what remains of the Grand Temple of Artemis. It is said to be unmatched in splendor, made entirely of marble with many columns rising to 60 feet in height. The rise of Christianity brought an end to the worship of Artemis, the temple falling to ruin. On a steep hill just outside the city of Ephesus are the ruins of a grand basilica built by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian. It stands over the believed burial site of John the Evangelist. It is a popular pilgrimage site owing to miracles attributed to the saint. It also offers a good vantage point of the city below. The Apostle John is also known to be the one Jesus entrusted his mother to at his death on the cross. As John spent his days preaching in Ephesus, it is said that he also brought the Blessed Virgin Mary along with him. Under the gentle sway of trees, we walk over to a small, nondescript stone house, considered a holy place for Catholics and Muslims alike. This is said to be the house of the Blessed Virgin Mary during her last days before her Assumption to Heaven. The discovery of the house came as described through visions revealed to a German nun, Anne Catherine Emmerich who has never been to Ephesus herself. The detailed descriptions led archaeologists to find the house on top of this hill near Ephesus. Indeed, it was a peaceful, prayerful sanctuary amidst the busy streets of Ephesus. A good friend of mine, Erdogan Menexe, President of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association in Turkey, recommended that I visit Haluk Ozil at his hangar at the Seljuk Ephesus Airport. As he opened his hangar to welcome me, I was surprised to see such a beautiful and well-maintained fleet of flying machines. Haluk is into microlights and ultralights. <laughs> After a quick pre-flight, taking out the aircraft did not necessarily need a touch. You will sit this side. Sure. I don't scare you. <laughs> <laughs> he was happy to let me fly left seat. Not so much traffic in this small airport, so we were off right away. It was a short take of roll and kind of funny taking off alongside cars on the parallel highway. Each new airport and new aircraft makes flying such an exciting adventure. The Basilica of St. John was just at the approach end of the runway. And just two to three miles away was the ancient city of Ephesus which Haluk wanted me to see from the air. From this vantage point, one can clearly see where the harbor ended to meet the Aegean Sea. Today, the coast is over a mile away from where it used to be. We flew over the Aegean coast, over its long stretches of white sand and turquoise waters. We were ready to land after the short sightseeing trip. The aircraft landed shorter than its takeoff roll. I found out shortly that Haluk could easily bring this aircraft inside the hangar without any assistance from mechanics. <laughs> you know your hangar very well. <laughs> well, it's thank a... you. I enjoyed very much. Uh, very happy uh, together fly. Me uh, too. Nothing beats a pleasant, easy flight over grand ancient ruins. Finally, back in Istanbul, I was able to catch a semi-ritual. 
practiced by the Sufi dervishes spinning in a trance-like state, aiming to free the soul from the world and bringing oneself closer to God. This is yet another layer in Turkey's multicultural heritage. I marvel at my journey through 4,000 years of history. Turkey is a place of never-ending discoveries, a place with a unique heritage, steeped in culture and filled with experiences never short of the divine. This has been your captain, Joy Roa. See you in the next Asian Air Safari.